Well, welcome back. I uh, I missed two weeks here of, of making these videos. Um, just sickness running through the house and it caught up to me and then some scheduling conflicts uh, in, in the office world here in the church. But here we are. Um, this week we are teaching our children about the wedding at Cana. Um, this is a, <clears throat> an interesting story. We get it in the book of John, the gospel according to John, uh, where he tells this story about Jesus. Now, this isn't young Jesus, as in, you know, like, <clears throat> like in our previous story where he was a boy. Um, Jesus is a man here, and he already has some disciples. And he finds himself attending a wedding in this place called Cana. And um, it's up in this, this mountain region. And weddings back then, especially if you think of a small village um, opposed to like the bigger city kind of thing, um, there, there was some things that were different about them than our weddings. And one of the things we're going to do in Sunday school this coming week um, is I have a bunch of pictures uh, from all the kids, their parents, um, those that I know the parents of, uh, of pictures from their wedding. And we can look at that and it's, it's kind of fun to see, you know, oh, here's this, this person, but they're younger than you know, than you've ever known them kind of thing um, for them to see that. In, in the biblical times, in this culture, in that context, one of the big things about the wedding was the feast, the celebration, and that the couple would put on a feast. And the, the story goes, and it talks about how um, they ran out of wine at the wedding. And that might seem like a small thing, but it's not a small thing. It was a, it's actually a huge issue, um, and one that would put shame on the on the couple um, and especially in that small community where everyone knows everyone and basically the entire community is at the wedding um, that would carry on into their entire marriage this shame and it'd be a reminder and they'd be you know oh that's jill and john and you know they ran out of wine at their wedding they weren't able to feed everyone at their wedding kind of thing and there was a level of shame that was attached to that and so in John chapter 2, um, <clears throat> the first uh, verse 1 to 11, it says, On the third day there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus was also invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus, being Mary, uh, said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Now, some people have taken that and, you know, if you responded to your mother today and you called her, you know, woman kind of thing, that's kind of a, a disrespectful in a way. That wasn't the case here. Don't take it that way. Uh, so, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. So he has this response, you know, she's asking him to do something about it because she knows who Jesus is. She remembers the visit from the angel. She remembers moments growing up and he obviously knows who he is and he, he already has his disciples. So his time is approaching, um, but his mother asks him to do something about it. And so one of the teaching points that we can pull from this is what does it mean to honor your mother and father? What does it mean to listen to their requests and do the things that they want you to do and, uh, and to honor them? Uh, it says, Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification. So as they came into the wedding, they all had to wash their hands. And so they had these jars for that, um, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. So 20 gallons, 75 liters. Um, so 30 gallons, I guess, would be over 100 liters. Um, Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now had become wine, and he did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn in the water knew. The master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. 
This was the first sign of Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. So the master of the feast would not be like the groom or, or the bride's father or something like that. This was like a, a culinary expert, someone that you would bring in to cater and take care of the event. And so he, he gets a taste of the wine so that he can approve it to go out kind of thing. And, uh, you know, this is a man who has tasted probably thousands upon thousands of cups of wine in his, in his work. And uh, he's amazed at the quality of the wine. And he says, you know, usually you would put your best wine first when, when people can actually taste things properly. Um, and then as the event goes on, then you would bring out the lesser quality stuff. But you've waited until now. Now, they actually didn't. They, they ran out of all of their wine. They had no more wine. But Jesus stepped in and created wine, turned water into wine. Um, and that's, that in itself is an interesting note that you can bring to your child is that when, when God makes something, you can look at the creation account and he says, this is very good, this is very good, this is very good, then sin taints it. But when God remakes something as well, it is very good. Uh, and so he makes this wine, he makes it out of nothing, well, out of water, he turns water into wine, makes a new creation out of it. Um, and, uh, and it's very good. We can take this and foreshadow it to where it talks in the Bible about the Christian and how those of us who are in Christ are a new creation. And I, I want to make the point, and you should make the point to your child as well, that it is very good, that it is a good creation, a new creation. Yes, we have our flaws and we stumble and we fail, but that it's very good. And what's interesting is, you know, sure, the master of the feast, he declares it as very good. He recognizes, rather, that it's very good. But when God made things in Genesis, in the creation account, he declared them to be good, and thus they were good. And when he makes us a new creation, he says, this is very good, and it is, because he declared it to be so. Um, and so you can make that point to your child, and it's a good thing for them to remember. I've, I've sat through some teaching before where we talk about the curse of sin, and and the problem of sin and how, you know, or curse nature and all this stuff. And there's a value to that and we need to understand that. But it needs to be met with the other side of, but those of you who are in Christ are redeemed. There's a new creation, a new nature being worked out in you. And you are very good um, to see the value that God has placed upon you in his renewing of you is a very good thing. We also can talk to our children about what does it mean to honor our parents. Um, a lot of the times, I imagine, you know, you're getting your kids ready for school. You're getting ready to come to church on Sunday morning or you're trying to get them to bed or, or to clean up their room properly or, or whatever. And there's times of disobedience. There's, I mean, there was when you were a kid to your parents and there is with your children to you. And what we want to instill into our children is that it's good for them to listen to their parents, to honor their parents, because their parents, you, you know what's best for them. You're trying to develop them to be good members of society and men and women of God and, and, and just to develop them properly. Um, and, and it's also good because God asks us to honor our mother and father, and so we should do that. And by doing so, we, we honor God. But comes the question of why, why did God do, why did Jesus, yes, God, why did Jesus do this miracle? He says to his mother, it is not my time, but then he does it anyway. So he honors his mother, and I think we can get a hint there near the end. Um, in verse 11, this is the first of the signs of Jesus did in Canaan and Galilee, and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. So he had these disciples who he was teaching and they were walking with him. This is the first miraculous thing that they see him do. And it confirmed their suspicion, right? It confirmed what they thought, but they weren't, they weren't 100% on. This is the Messiah. This is the one. No one else. Think about this. You can take a cup of water and put it in front of your child and say, can you turn this into wine? And you can take it to a thousand people. You can take it to a million people. You can take it to every person. There might be someone who has like a little powder in their sleeve that they try to like put in there, like Kool-Aid mix and mix it up. That's not what he did. 
That's not what he did. Think about the volume of, of, of the wine. This is not like the magicians, um, you know, with Moses, where they put dry blood into their little bowl of water kind of thing. No, this, this is the work of God. And he and he alone can do it. And they recognized that and believed in him. And one of the things we can do is we can look at the work of Jesus in the Bible, the miraculous things that he did, and the work of Jesus in our own life, where he makes us a new creation, where he restores us and changes us and we recognize the difference within us. And from that, we can say, I believe and my faith is increased and my belief is increased. And I recognize that you, you, Jesus, are the Messiah. So there's that. Um, suggested activities. Talk to your family about how it feels as a Christian um, when they honor their parents. So sometimes, you know, your, your child is caught. You, you catch them not doing what you ask them to do or, or disobeying you in something. And there's often, you know, especially with a young child, there's a sense of shame that comes over them. And maybe they'll, they'll close up a little bit or, or they'll start to cry or, or they'll go into a little ball. And it's not you being overly aggressive. It's just they don't have control over their emotions. and They recognize that they've done something wrong. And, uh, and, but versus when, when they do something right and you come to them and you're like, thank you for listening to me. Thank you for doing what I asked you to do. And, and there's, there's a joy and a delight in that. And that it's good for us to listen to our parents and to remember those outcomes and so that we can, we can listen to those who God has addressed us to. Um, as a family, make a list of some of the other miracles Jesus did and ask your children if they are possible for people to do on their own. Can you turn water into wine? No, you cannot. Can you walk on water? No, you cannot. Can you make a, a deaf man hear? Can you make a blind man see? Can you make a lame man walk? Can you heal a leper? Can you... Various things. Feed 5,000 people with, you know, a little bit of food. No, you can't. But God can. And the power of God is, is unimaginable. It, it's, it's beyond our comprehension. Um, and so we can talk to them about that. There's a little coloring page there of Jesus going up and, and, and with the, the big stone uh, vases of water there. That is our lesson for this week. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out and I'm happy to help. Have a great week and honor God in all that you do.